Just ahead, there's another edition of the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks and in the Orlando area of Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith, Public Affairs Director of the Florida News Network. And I'm Rack Contour and Man About Town, Al Spry. We have a jam-packed show. We have Detective Barbara Bergen of Crime Line and Kathy Rick Jewell of the Miami International Boat Show. Boy, I talk about a diverse conversation today, huh? We're, <laughs> we, we are going to have it. We hope that uh, you will stick around and enjoy it. Some interesting things to hear. Stay put. The Florida Roundtable begins following these messages. This is the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks. I'm Reagan Smith, Public Affairs Director of the Florida News Network. I'm political commentator Al Spry. Reagan, we are so happy to be doing this again. Absolutely, and, and uh, on Tough TV 38, I, I didn't mention that's that. That's right, three yeah. times a week you can watch us on TV. Uh, we shaved this morning, we actually put on deodorant. <laughs> and uh, you can check us out on Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays on Tough TV 38 at 9 a.m. And if you don't get Tough TV... Just like Will Strickler says, you call your cable operator, you don't use any threats, we're a peaceful organization here, but we're going to make it happen. <laughs> you say, I want my tough TV. Also heard on 80 stations across Florida on the Florida News Network. It's great to be here again uh, talking about, first off, the winner and loser this week in politics. The winner, Jeb Bush. Good Ooh, old Jeb. Catching okay. fire, catching steam. Hmm. Maybe, I don't know, catching something. <laughs> Maybe not, hopefully not catching any diseases. Mitt yeah. Romney's decision not to run for president, of course, removes a significant obstacle uh, to George Bush's son's ability mm. to lock down his status as the favorite candidate of the establishment wing. We were talking about Phyllis Schlafly with the yes. she's the anti-establishment wing. Right. And uh, this is the establishment wing of the GOP, which usually picks the nominee. What do you mean usually picks the nominee? Well, how about <laughs> always picks the nominee? With, 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 with the exception of Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan. Yeah, but all right. So for the last right. 35 <laughs> years, they've picked they've the nominee. They've done it since 1936. Oh, yeah. Two generations of doing yeah. that. <laughs> um, and uh, so we're going to uh, be uh, talking more, of course, about Jeb. I like what uh, Jeb's mom said, no more bushes. Of course, turning to the loser of the week, it's Blaze Ignolia, the state rep from Hernando County, may wind up regretting his recent defeat of the governor's favored candidate for state GOP chairman if his party turns into a nearly irrelevant vessel that Republican leaders bypass in favor of pumping money into their own political committees. Rick Scott, Senate President Andy Gardner, have pulled their campaign money out of the GOP, and Scott last week declined to say whether he even trusts this dude, hmm. not very good. Yeah. Hey, while we're at it, Al, uh, record number of Republican candidates out there may be jockeying for president of the United States, as many as 10 of them. And uh, new numbers just out indicate the leader in the Iowa polls right now is Scott Walker, the governor of Wisconsin. Uh, our, one of our friends, the senator from Kentucky, Rand Paul, is running second and third. Jeb Bush is down as far as number five. But also in there is Dr. Ben Carson. And I wanted, I wanted to mention, of those ten candidates, four of them live in Florida. This has never happened in presidential history before. Well, you know, I got to say, and a lot of people don't know this, Reagan, but Florida has uh, the strongest real estate law in the world. Uh, if you buy property here, you can hide assets. Uh, they can't take your property away as long as you're a homestead. Uh, so I think that's one reason uh, well, a lot of people like uh, getting homes in Florida and living, at least course, living here some of the time. Two of the candidates have been have been here a long time. One, you've mentioned, obviously, former Governor Jeb Bush. The other is U.S. Senator Marco Rubio. But many people don't know that Dr. Ben Carson is retired and has a large home in West Palm Beach. And former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee lives in the Florida Panhandle. So... <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, turning to uh, this, this looks interesting. You know, of course, we've been talking about the prisons lately and uh, the Florida Department of Corrections Secretary Julie Jones is trying to put a positive spin on negative reports about scandal, death and the, ex sex the excessive use of force at her agency Monday. Uh, she told the Senate committee the agency faces 
a perception problem. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> well, when you abuse prisoners, they end up dead, and you go, oh, I don't know how they ended up dead. Maybe that does cause a bit of a perception problem. Uh, you know, I love politicians when they try to wiggle their way out of things, but it's hard to wiggle your way out of this stuff, especially since there's proof here of mm. something not quite right in Denmark. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. mean, I mean Florida, not Denmark. But you know what I mean. Well, the obstacles are temporary, she says. Her assurances are that the proposal to spend $15 million on infrastructure improvements and $16.5 million on hiring new staff will bring a new day for the department. It was greeted with skepticism by some members of the Senate committee. We'll watch that one very closely. Uh, time for us to pause along the network line here. We'll remind you that this is the Florida Roundtable, the service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks in the Orlando area on Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. We'll continue our conversation in a moment. We are back. You're listening to the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. And Al, as promised, we are joined in studio this day by Detective Barbara Bergen from the Central Florida Crime Line Program. And uh, Detective, nice to have you with us today. And thank you very much for having us join you. Take the uh, first uh, half minute or minute here and, and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm the Executive Director of Central Florida Crime Line, which is the anonymous tip line here for six counties. Um, I'm a retired law enforcement officer from the Orlando Police Department with 25 and a half years and spent 10 and a half of those years in homicide. So I've seen the violent crimes um, as part of my career. And today I'm fortunate enough to be a part of a program that still helps solve cases where I don't have to get up in the middle of the night. We just, <laughs> we just take phone calls. And How see all now? these bodies and it's <laughs> messy and, it, you know. Yeah, I can <laughs> still be on vacation and deal with this job. So it's, it's nice. But okay. we're, we're very successful across the um, you know, in, in what we do as far as being an anonymous tip line. Well, it, it's hard to believe that there would be people out there who might not understand uh, what Crime Line is and does. So before we get into your, your current focus, uh, tell us just a little bit in general about it, in, well, just in case. I'm also very fortunate in that I'm the vice president of Crime Stoppers for the state of Florida, and I sit on the National Crime Stopper Board for Crime Stoppers. So what we do, and we've been doing it for about 38 years, is Crime Stoppers is a completely anonymous tip line. Um, we take tips on the phone, we take tips via the web, and we take text tips. All of those tips come into phone numbers. We don't trap, trace, record you. We don't have IP addresses. We have no idea if you're calling us from Australia or across the street. And once your tip comes in, it is then sent to local law enforcement who's charged with investigating that tip. And if it helps solve cases then you could be eligible for a cash reward. And we're all nonprofits, which is very cool. Now, that's a good question. If it's anonymous, how do they find you for your cash reward? Well, we have a system in place where we have interaction with the tipsters, and it's, it, it almost falls back on them. They have to get back with us to follow up and get dispositions. And let's face this fact. Drugs are our number one tips. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the little lady who's living in a neighborhood and all of a sudden this rental property, some people moved in and there's constant traffic coming and going every 30 seconds. Somebody's pulling up. Mm -hmm. You see hand-to-hand -hand transactions going on. With that, you're going to see an increase in local burglaries. With that, you may see an increase in some violent crimes because this is now a drug house. Yeah. And so that lady doesn't really want to call the local law enforcement and have a marked unit pull up in her front yard and sign a statement. So we exist so that they can call anonymously behind a closed door, let law enforcement know, it'll get investigated, and we remove that cancer from your neighborhood before it gets much worse. Um, and th when the house gets busted, she knows, oh, my tip must have helped. And so they're calling us sometimes within an hour to say, hey, where's my cash money? Um, and there's a system in place for how sure. we pay them out. Um, it is a cash reward. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a board of directors who decide what those rewards are. And it, it's Crime Stoppers is hugely successful, hugely taking yeah. thousands of people off the street. Is this one of those things that's tied to an actual conviction or, or the board is convinced nope. that they've got good information? And you know, it's, it would be unreasonable of us to ask a citizen to wait for a conviction yeah, because yeah. you all know some of these um, crimes can take years, years especially yeah. when we're talking yeah. homicides. Yeah. Um, so we deal in solving the cases. What happens on the court side of it in mm -hmm. prosecution and deals and things like that, 
Um, there's no waiting for that. It wouldn't. It we wouldn't be successful yeah. if we asked yeah. citizens. Well, and to that's wait. not really your purview as law enforcement. You're getting them arrested and then passing it on, right. and then they have to take care of it in the judicial system. But how did uh, Crime Line come about? Whose idea was it? Was it you first in other states and then brought here to Florida? Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about how it was put in place. Well, thank you for that opportunity because it is great educational. Um, Crime Stoppers started in Albuquerque, and there was a detective, Greg. Um, was Greg McAleese was the detective and he had a homicide and he had a guy a young kid that was shot and killed as a clerk in an overnight convenience store gas station and you know 38 years ago we don't have the convenience of the videos that we have today and things like that so basically he had a homicide with no evidence and no witnesses and he said to his supervisors do you think it's possible that we could come out to our community and say please call us we don't want to know who you are but we're going to offer you a cash reward if you'll call. And he literally slept in his at his desk for a couple of days wow. to answer his phone because they used his phone number. And guess what? It worked. And it worked. And yeah. from that, the Orlando Police Department and the current mayor in Orlando decided within six months it hit the news. It was a big story. They decided to go ahead and send a detective and some people down to yeah. Albuquerque to study it. So the city of Orlando started Crime Line. It was Crime Watch initially, became Crime Line. And we have now grown to be one of the largest Crime Stopper programs in North America. We're taking 12,000 tips a year here. So wait a minute. The current mayor you're talking about uh, of Orlando? No, the, the, the mayor at the time, the mayor 38 at the time. years ago. Okay. So, and, and the chief of police said, this is something great that idea. could be a huge hit in our community. Let's, let's run with it. And so we've been very fortunate to have a well-established Crime Stopper program and we're, and we're recognized for the, the numbers that we do. Yeah. We're, we're doing significant work here in the community. Now, you have a current focus uh, of responsible gun ownership, and we want to hear about this. Right. Um, I was approached by uh, Sheriff Demings here in Orange County, and he, um, they started looking at their numbers. And the significance of this program is the number of firearms that are being stolen from unlocked vehicles and residents. It's it's just huge. We're talking 83% of the firearms that are being stolen are from unsecured vehicles and homes. So 500 guns hit the street and 83% of them, how many of those wouldn't have been stolen had somebody locked their car, had they locked yeah. their house? Mm -hmm. There's no forced entry in these things. They mean they're just open. They're, no lock, not the door's not locked, not anything. Exactly. And you know, we have, um, one of the problems with vehicle burglaries is if you're a bad guy and you're doing vehicle burglaries, you're going to pick a populated area or a dark street, and you're yeah. going to walk down the street, and you're going to flip door handles. Mm -hmm. And the one that opens is the easy burglary for you. Because it's open. Because it's yeah. open. You don't have, yeah. to, you don't you don't have, have to break to, glass and worry right. about the noises and all those things. You don't have to jimmy things. a lock or anything. It's just open for you. So this has become pretty common, um, and that's where we're losing a, a significant number of guns. And these are handguns, which are even worse because they're easier for the bad guy to conceal. Mm -hmm. um, and walk around with. You know, the long weapons, it takes a little more concealment and stuff like that. But these handguns hitting the street are dangerous. The other part of this, and the reason it's tying in the next week, is we're losing law enforcement officers. They're being killed with stolen guns. Not only law enforcement, but even citizens. So. Yeah, I, I, I think it's important when you're a gun owner not to be distracted by, obviously, the world is distracting enough. You know, people are busy. And maybe they don't put a lot of thought into their daily lives. But if you're if you're not going to secure your guns, not only could they be stolen, but family members can use them to shoot themselves, to shoot others. Kids, of course, we're hearing about kids shooting and as well. So uh, if you could touch on that as well. Yeah. Uh, what I would say doesn't matter where you live. Could be in South Florida, could be in the Panhandle. Doesn't matter anywhere in this country, anywhere. Um, just because a gun is out of sight. That is not a secured weapon. Mm -hmm. You know, in a drawer, in a closet, in a box somewhere, those are not secured weapons. There are a number of items out there that can help you secure and lock your, via your, your guns yeah. up. Um, gun safes, um, gun locks, mm -hmm. you name it. There's all kinds of items out there that will help you secure them. But just because you put it in a drawer and shove the drawer shut and put something over the top of it, that is not a secured firearm. No, that's <laughs> that's not secured. <laughs> that's just silly. <laughs> but, but people and, do it every day, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, and and I don't understand why why they think that that's enough protection. I, I to me, there's a disconnect there. I mean, people are people are not that stupid, are they? They are. Really? Unfortunately, <laughs> and and yeah. and the worst, you know, I have a lot of friends who say to me, 
I've taught my children to not touch my guns. Well, children, what is it, age 20, 25 or something, before our brains are fully developed and we're making some of the better decisions. But kids who are 12 and 13, um, they may know better, and they may have been threatened by you to not touch Mm -hmm. your guns and things of that nature. What do you think about their friends, though, when they're coming over? Sure. And they've bragged about or talked about, or those friends are not so well-behaved, that's not going to stop them from going and looking. Um, the curiosity factor. Absolutely. And so. So is this now, is this more of an educational campaign or, yes. uh, and, and you're, so you're looking for public outreach and hopefully in an adult's mind who owns a gun say, God, I, I never thought about it that way. I haven't been doing that. Right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Um, you know, in, a, in this great country we live in, and it is that we're given the opportunity and we have the ability to own guns. We're not. We're not here to talk about that. What we're here to talk about is if you're going to do that, be responsible for it. Yeah, and, and you know, that's kind of uh, important to understand that without responsibility, you can't have freedom. Your freedom requires a modicum of uh, responsibility, and uh, I think it's really important. Uh, well, here's a nice program that you guys are, are doing is the, uh, the gun buyback programs if you could talk a little bit about that that's a neat program yeah we actually have a couple of those so it locally here in central florida we have what's called kicks for guns that happens every august and actually next week on friday the orange county sheriff's office will have a gun buyback that is a completely anonymous you come in you bring a gun you don't want anymore and we're going to hand you a 50 dollar gift card we don't ask any questions we don't talk to you about who you are or anything like that you hand us a gun, we hand you a gift card, you go on about your day. Mm. So for people who have weapons that maybe there's been a lifestyle change or they simply don't have a need for it anymore, gun buybacks are a great tool for getting some guns off of the street. Yeah, and uh, I think it's a great idea. Is that being rolled out in other counties as well? You know, we're heard all over Florida, obviously. Uh, there, are, they... there are some other counties. You know, I think last year we had 14 locations which was out in Volusia and Polk County and things like that. And our goal is always to bring additional agencies on. One day, we do it right before school, sort of an awareness for kids. Um, One day, 12 hours, this is what we do. Anonymity for turning your gun in. Yeah, Uh, Interchange. Uh, You know, Miami, West Palm Beach, Fort Lauderdale, Pensacola. The the programs are out there. How often do its officials uh, talk with each other and exchange ideas? Well, you know, they they have law enforcement meetings. They have community meetings and stuff like that. And those of us in the Crime Stopper world, we have uh, quarterly meetings and things. So we do discuss these programs and... At the end of the day, you have to come up with the cash to give the $50 gift cards away. That's a little bit of a challenge for some (laughs) people, right? But I always say this. I have some people who believe you're not getting crime guns off the street at the gun buybacks. And and they're right. It's a small percentage. Last year, we did 800 guns, and I think 40-some of them were what we call crime guns. Stolen, serial numbers gone, things of that nature, illegal, sawed-off shotguns and stuff. You're right. We're not getting that many of those guns. But what I am doing is I'm getting that gun beca- before it becomes a statistic. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, that's a great program. Crime Line is, is an excellent program. You folks have been uh, uh, it's very successful, it sounds like. Website, more information. Um, it's crimeline.org. And what I would like to remind all of your listeners and viewers about is there are Crime Stopper programs up and down Florida. Become familiar with your Crime Stopper program. Know how to give a tip. And if you know anybody in your community who is illegally in possession of a gun, felons, things of that nature, illegal guns, please get in touch with your local Crime Stopper program. Detective Barbara Bergen, Crime Line in Central Florida, thank you so much for visiting with us this day and come back and do this again. Thank you. You're listening to the Florida Roundtable, the service of Florida's Talk and Entertainment Networks and of Tough TV 38, and we'll continue in a moment. From Pensacola to Key West and all points in between, you're listening to the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks and in the Orlando area on Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith. And I'm Al Spry. And Al, as promised, we are off to South Florida, where we are delighted to welcome back to the Florida Roundtable Kathy Rick Jewell. She's the Vice President of the National Marine Manufacturers Association. It's been a whole year since Kathy was here with us, and, and uh, our last visit, uh, the topic was the Miami International Boat Show. And I've and missed you, Kathy, wow. and we got to briefly meet last year, and I know you were busy, and you probably met like 100,000 people, but anyway, <laughs> it was nice to run into you, 
and uh, it was really nice to attend your boat show. Um, it gave us some really good ideas about the next boat that I want, uh, which would actually be the first boat. Uh, but, uh, you know, hey, you got to start somewhere. So uh, tell us a little bit about the Miami International Boat Show, uh, what you got going on this year versus last year, uh, a little bit of the history of it, and uh, we'll roll in there. Sure. Well, the uh, 74th Miami International Boat Show will open the doors on February 12th. We're obviously very, very excited to present, again, uh, the best that the boating industry puts forward every year. You will see previews, premieres, unveilings, uh, the latest and the greatest technology, and it's always here at the Miami International Boat Show every year. Uh, we have three locations, as you re might remember, as you made your way around the show last year. The Miami Beach Convention Center is the biggest location that we currently house. We have over 700 boats at that location alone inside, another 500 or so boats outside, and every boating accessory you can possibly imagine. Uh, you can get yourself on a shuttle bus over to the Sea Al Marina and Yachting Center, uh, where we've got another 200 boats in the water. And a lot of those boats there are... Uh, uh, there to present what we call our Discover Boating Hands-On Skills Training. So you can register for a variety of topics, um, this, you know, to get out on the water, uh, get, your, get your sea legs under you, if you will, um, essential boating safety, first mate skills, uh, basic close quarter maneuvering, but, you know, things that really can help assist you and make your boating experience a lot better. Close quarter maneuvering, that sounds interesting. Tell me more. Well, basically, participants will learn how to handle their boat in a tight space and maneuver close to piers and docks and, and fixed, uh, you know, fixed objects with a little maybe more confidence than they might have today. See, and I thought it was about reaching for your beer without <laughs> spilling it, you know? It's like close That's quarters and stuff. It's all maneuverability, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. And I, I, when I was looking at some of these boats, boats, of course, is a misnomer. Some of these are like luxury hotels. Well, wow. <laughs> we've got we've got a boat for every budget. Exactly. Budget for every yeah, boat. they have little the smaller smaller vessels, and of course, all the way up to uh, to multi tiered yachts. So it's uh, it's really uh, it's really incredible. How it, it, it is incredible. How do you how do we talk a little bit about the process of of putting this together and the various companies that come in and participate with you? Well, you know, that's one of those things that you, uh, opening morning, you always marvel at, but we have got, obviously, you know, uh, 1,600 of the best boat engine and accessories manufacturers, pr you know, presenting here at the show, um, and they all know what, you know, what they need to do and when they need to do it, and, you know, behind them, we've got an experienced team, probably on the team of the Miami International Boat Show, we've got well over, oh, gosh, probably as, as much as 200 years of experience with this show, so... I myself, I've been managing the show for 20 years, and the team that I have built here with me um, have, you know, some have been with me as long as that, all those 20 years and even longer. So, uh, you know, we've got a, a great team and a great group of uh, exhibitors that really, you know, put their best foot forward when it comes to getting this show. Is this a full-time gig for you, or is this something you do in addition to other stuff? <laughs> this is a full-time gig. Um, you know, we produced uh, 22 consumer boat shows. And oh, okay, because I'm thinking just like, yeah. hey, she's got one boat show. What does she do the rest of the year? So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, a co a couple to keep us busy. We've had, um, I think, oh, gosh, at last count, I think, in, in our division here, um, I opened up a show uh, at the beginning of the year in Atlanta, then on to... Uh, Chicago, then on to New York. From there to Baltimore, just closed on Sunday. Our Atlantic City show uh, opens this week, um, and on and on. So we've got another division that includes a lot of sports shows. So we've had, I think, probably before the month of January was, was closed, we'll have produced um, at least a dozen boat shows in major markets around the country. A couple of times here, once now and before we part company, tell the folks how they can get more information and uh, where tickets are available around the state. Well, all you need to do is log on to MiamiBoatShow.com. You'll be able to advance uh, purchase your tickets right there on the ticket link. There's lots of information about uh, where to park and how to park and all the different uh, seminars and features that we just talked about with the Discover Boating uh, hands-on skills training at the at our Sea Al Marina. We've got Fred Shedd at the Miami Beach Convention Center location, and then we've got at our sailboat show, which we didn't talk about, which is at Miami Marina at Bayside. Uh, yet the third the third uh, piece of the puzzle here, the third, third piece of the three-ring circus, I'll call it, um, 
is uh, got hundreds of sailing seminars and on the water sailing opportunities as well. So there's lots of things for people to do, and they can find all of that information on our website at MiamiBoatShow.com. Tell me more about this on the water stuff. I know you mentioned it earlier as well. How do people get on the water? Is it part of the ticket? Is it something you pay extra and then you have to sign up for times, or yeah, how does that work? Yeah, there's a very small registration fee, and yeah, you do need to go online and uh, log on. Uh, you know, places fill up quickly, so you want to get on board as quick as you can. Um, so, uh, and we still do have space available. So it's $20 in advance and $25 at the show if you book. And then, um, you know, there are some, uh, there, Discover Sailing gets you out on the water. That's a free service. You can just, you know, queue up and get on a boat and get out on the water. So there are also some opportunities to get out on the water that don't cost you anything and are included in the price of your ticket. Oh, that's cool. I, w- I was interested, uh, as, as a young man and college student and later on in radio and TV, I had many friends. I, I spent a lot of years in Cleveland, Ohio, on the south shore of Lake Erie, yeah. where I learned how to sail on a 40-footer, and I loved it. Uh, and I just wondered, you said you're going to have well, the, the third, uh, uh, the, the uh, Bayside is going to be dedicated to sailboats uh, yeah. uh, versus the motorboats and the yachts and the sailboats. Uh, how, does right. Florida, how does Florida stack up all, uh, with that kind of thing? Well, we've got a great selection of sailboats, and uh, one thing we're really proud of is we've pro- we have probably the largest selection of catamarans you'll find anywhere in the country. So if you want to see, you know, what what the sailing industry has put out this year, you're going to see it at that sailboat show. How did you uh, develop an interest in boating and uh, water? <laughs> well, it's a very interesting story as a girl from Montana, but um, I, I grew up, my, you know, my dad always had a boat. We did a lot of lake boating in the summer times, obviously, uh, when I was a kid. And when I um, got into my late 20s, I guess you'll say, I decided to strike out and, and, and uh, move to New York City and see what the world had to offer outside of uh, my little home state. And um, so that's how it really started. It just, I, uh, I ran into this job sort of on a, on a whim, and uh, it was really interesting to me. I really had always loved the water, and I, I just loved the whole, uh, the whole idea of working with, with people that built, you know, built boats, built engines, built accessories, um, and, you know, in the, in the boating business and the boat show business was just really fun. So I've enjoyed a 27-year career with with the National Marine Manufacturers Association, and the, the marine industry is a great, a, a great career opportunity for anybody. Aside from uh, displaying all in the latest uh, boats and the models and all of that sort of thing, and being one of the biggest boat shows in the country, uh, how much of a role do you play? Uh, does does boating safety and outreach play uh, in a show like this? Oh, it's very paramount for us. We um, certainly encourage. Um, you know, the, the best of boat production. We've got a lot of certification programs that our um, manufacturers are involved in, certifying to, um, eight, you know, standards that will make, make and allow for them to send boats all over the world. So, you know, building boats to ABY standards and above. Uh, we've got certification uh, programs for dealers so that the dealers are qualified to, you know, to service a boat, sell a boat. Um, understand what their customers' needs are, and all that lends itself to being safe. Um, you know, so uh, that's something that we promote very heavily, and, and those certification programs uh, really lend themselves to that. What's your uh, favorite type of bow? What's your favorite? Uh, are you allowed to say that? What, what type? Not brands, I guess. You can't really say a specific brand, but what's your favorite kind of bow? What do you like to to, to uh, sail in? The, the, the fa- my favorite kind of boat is the one that my husband and I own. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, and she's a she's a trawler style boat. So that's that's one of my favorites. But oh gosh, like I said before, there's a so boat you like fishing boat. You like you like fishing boat. boats and stuff. With uh, how 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 many feet long is it? It's thirty five feet. Very nice. Great fishing boat. Great cruising boat. Um, you know, very f- efficient diesel engine. So um, she's and probably a lot of fun, and we really do enjoy South Florida with her. That's and what's sure. the what's the name of the what's the name of the boat? The boat's name is Kathy Ann. Uh, Sleep six comfortably. <laughs> Named after you. Yeah, it's got a yeah, nice inside inside with that, so. inside cabin. Uh, it's an it's a called a command bridge, but nice. yeah, it's got a nice uh, aft deck, a nice uh, galley, nice master stateroom, a full head and shower. Um, so and and she's really maneuver for the two of us. We yeah. you know we can run her anywhere without any. That's awesome. At all. That's great. It is awesome. Now, Kathy, uh, one, th- one thing we didn't say, the Miami International Boat Show, 74th year, opens yeah. on February 12th. We didn't tell them how long it runs. 
Oh, sure. Well, we open on the 12th. Uh, we close on the 15th, which is President's Day. So we're op- open five days over that nice long holiday weekend where school is out on Monday, people are out of work on Monday. So uh, lots of fun and sun to share with everyone down here. That's for darn sure. All right. Well, Kathy, uh, Rick Jewell, the vice president of the National Marine Manufacturers Association, the 74th Miami International Boat Show, February 12th through the 15th. Thank you so much for visiting with us this day, and come back and do it again next year. Oh, absolutely. We'll look forward to seeing you down here. All righty. This is the Florida Roundtable, and we'll be back in a moment. We're back. You're listening to the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks, and in the Orlando area on Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. Great to be back, Reagan. Uh, of course, you can catch us on Tough TV 38 and 80 stations across Florida on the Florida Roundtable. I'd like to follow up with you about the politics of the presidency. You yeah. know, we've had uh, we've had Ron Paul and uh, Phyllis Schlafly, both uh, conservatives saying that the game is rigged, that you can't get a candidate in uh, the GOP unless they are given the, uh, shall we say, the uh, okay by the establishment, the Bushes and and those kind of folks. So how do you change that? Obviously, people are a little disillusioned by that, right? And it's it's amazing because uh, Phyllis makes the point that from 1936 up through the current time, uh, all but three of the presidential candidates were chosen by the establishment, the moneyed establishment in Wall Street and people in New York State. And the Midwest and the West never got a chance. And her point was that these politicians all buy into Franklin Roosevelt's America last foreign policy and overspending the Marshall Plan and keeping their hands on the money. They really don't care so much who the Republican candidate is as long as that candidate buys into perpetuating the current money structure. Well, listen to this. I don't know if it's name recognition or people just like the status quo, but 59% of Republicans want Jeb Bush to run. Mm. 19% want Marco Rubio to run. This is a newly released poll. It's Mason Dixon. This is registered Florida voters. Suggests Sunshine Staters are much more enthusiastic about Bush running than Rubio. The poll finds only 15% of Florida voters think Rubio should run for president. And that's total 15% of Florida voters, 19% of Republicans, uh, while 57% thinks he should run for the U.S. Senate again. 42% of voters, 59% of Republicans, think Jeb should run, and 31% think he should not. Now, why do you think... Nobody likes uh, Marco. Why is Marco not feeling the love? Well, I don't, I don't think that at all. Uh, I also would buy into the notion that the Gallup and Harris polls are biased you towards think so? the establishment. So it's not that people aren't uh, uh, feeling the love. You're thinking that the results are biased, perhaps. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, if, if it looks like he is gaining ground, you will watch the establishment go to work. To knock him down. Well, that happened down. to Ron Paul in yeah. Iowa. And Ron Paul you, almost won Iowa. You're going to see a repeat if it looks like so, Marco Rubio. So, if is that's the case, why even have elections if they're all rigged? Well, <laughs> we haven't given up on going through the motions. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the, the Constitution does call for these things. But, but you know, if it's rigged and it's you, it's worthless unless people change the way that they're voting and they start getting informed. Then it's just, uh, it's just. Uh, well, and it, now you curtains. put you, you put your finger right. on it. People have to get informed. Yeah, but they're and not getting informed. Well, they're I watching know. six hours of TV a day and playing video games. Yeah, and and that's not how. That's you not the way to be informed. That's not how you make an. No offense to choice. any of our uh, video game playing, <laughs> uh, TV watching <laughs> audience, uh, well, but <laughs> we just think you should broaden your horizons possibly a little bit and start getting more informed on the issues. That's all. I think it's great for democracy. When, uh, when Americans can hold their representatives' feet to the fire and actually have a hand in choosing the right representatives who they want to uh, represent them. Because I don't see that. I haven't seen that in years. The people just keep getting screwed because the people that are put in office to represent them 
are not the it doing the best interests of the people. I don't think. Yeah, and that's not picking on any one party. No, I don't think we've it, seen that in a long time. It, it, it's the, it's true for both parties, uh, and and uh, sometimes referred to as the Me Too ism. You know, uh, the particular policies that were brought into place in the 1940s, the big money makers and all that involvement, uh, and and the establishment in the East has made sure that uh, the Republican candidate says, well, me too. Uh, it's, it's the old, um, there's nothing wrong with this policy, but we can do it better. And that's how they run the campaign. And, and the, the banking people really don't care as long as they keep their hands in. Rand Paul, speaking of Ron's son, is actually headed to Sarasota on the 14th uh, for Valentine's Day. He's going to be uh, holding a free rally uh, down in, uh, in Sarasota. Mm-hmm. And then attend a dinner at Bobby Jones Golf and Country Club, and uh, that's a uh, something where he, of course, of course, it's a fundraiser. Uh, but uh, so there's something right there. And additionally, Marco Rubia is Iowa bound for a book signing. He's just written a new book, and uh, he's going to be traveling a little bit, getting his name out there. Obviously, he's interested in running. You could tell already. Uh, well, we'll see. <laughs> it's it's, it's going to be a very crowded field, and we'll see what happens. And uh, in the meantime. Nobody's talking about Hillary. I don't know. <laughs> you know uh, and maybe, maybe that's a She's good conserving. thing. I don't She's know. conserving <laughs> her money right now. <laughs> she is. Well, I'll tell you what. We'll take another pause along the network line here. Let us remind you that you are listening to the Florida Roundtable. We're a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks. And in the Orlando area, we are seen three times each week on Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. We'll have a closing thought in a moment. You're listening to the Florida Roundtable, a service of Florida's talk and entertainment networks, and in the Orlando area on Tough TV 38. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. And uh, we hope that you have enjoyed the conversation this day. We certainly have uh, roamed far afield in many, many different areas today, Al. Yeah, we went from gun control, not gun control, but the crime line, locking up your guns, yeah. not taking them away. Responsible gun ownership. Uh, responsible gun ownership to buying a boat. So we're talking about, you know... Don't bring your boat on a gun and don't bring your gun on a boat. And you yeah. can give your guns away. You could probably give your boat away if you get tired of it, too. There, but anyway. Yeah. So uh, Romney is out. Of yep. course, I want to bring that up. Uh, he met with Jeb Bush what, last week in Utah at some secret meeting. And then all of a sudden he decides not to run. There you go with your Eastern yeah. re- Republican establishment I, I, th- I think that's what it is. We never did hear anybody come out and talk about their conversation or the meeting. And you won't. And all we got was the announcement that Romney's not running this time. So, and I think Romney's, you know, he was toast after he lost the second time. People just don't want him. They don't want Romney. Uh, he's a, uh, you know, he's got, he's got negatives. He, that is not it, to say he couldn't change his mind again. <laughs> he know, could, I mean, but I don't think he will. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, think, I think Romney, you know, he's twice lost. And I think when you twice lose, you're damaged goods. Yeah. All things considered, uh, you know, his father was the uh, president of uh, American Motors and, and a multiple term governor of Michigan years ago uh, who had presidential ambitions. And, well, he ran. And, and, sure. and booted it. He never got past the primaries. Yeah. Uh, his claim that the generals in Vietnam had brainwashed him and that kind of washed him out. Of, of 1964, mm-hmm. but where I'm going with this is that the son Mitt uh, has certainly carried the the family's ambitions much farther than his father ever did. Yeah, and you know I'm not feeling sorry for him. He's got a lot of money, and uh, he's still a uh, top dog in uh, the white uh, establishment uh, status quo that we uh, live in, and uh, so he's he's not hurting for anything. No. You and know. he and he won't be either. Yeah, and and you know what he was governor. That's pretty darn good, I think. Oh, Massachusetts. That's yeah. Right. I mean, dad dad had Michigan, which if in those days was a pretty good shot. And always remember, folks, if it wasn't for Mitt Romney, we would not have Obamacare. <laughs> if Mitt Romney hadn't created the model which they called Romney Care at the time yep. in Massachusetts, which is still being used, we would not have Obamacare cuz Obamacare is just Romney Care rolled out on a national scale. Yeah. Interesting, that's, right? That's, that's what it is, and, and they admitted to that, too. So, uh, well, yeah, I, I think you've nailed it on the head there. Scheduled to be with us uh, next week uh, is an old friend of the show that hasn't been here for a while, and that is uh, Orlando-area Congressman Alan Grayson. 
uh, who has kind of taken on a, sort of a new mantra since the uh, first couple times he was here. Uh, and he has not been back since he's been in the minority. So it's going to be interesting to talk to him about the differences. Yeah, you know, we like to get both sets of opinions here on the show. And uh, so it'll be nice to talk to Alan. I, uh, I like Alan. He's a character. Yeah, yes, he is. Uh, love him or hate him, you know where he stands, that's for sure. He does put it out there, and, and uh, there is no room for, well, I'm not really sure how he feels, <laughs> you know. He, he, he does that. Well, if you have somebody you'd like to hear, let us know. Uh, you can contact us by email or uh, 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 on Facebook or, or um, snail mail if you have to. Thank you for your time this day. Uh, we know you have lots of choices out there. I'm Reagan Smith. I'm Al Spry. We'll see you again next week. You've been listening to Florida Roundtable, a weekly look at issues and problems of concern to Floridians from a state, national, and international perspective. Presented by the Florida News Network with your hosts, Reagan Smith and Al Spry. The views and opinions expressed during the preceding program are solely those of the participants and not necessarily those of this station's ownership, management, or sponsors of FNN. Your views and opinions are welcome. Address your card or letter to Florida Roundtable in care of Reagan Smith, 2500 Maitland Center Parkway, Suite 407, Maitland, Florida, 32751. Or you may email reagansmith at fnnonline.com. Thank you for listening, and please join us again next week for another edition of Florida Roundtable.